Hey, hello and welcome to the ANSCA Embellishment Workshop for Modern Piano. My name is Tony Betros and I'm the General Manager of ANSCA Music Examinations. I'd like to welcome two exciting presenters today, Cynthia Delaney and Dr. Kerry Van Leeflang. Their main focus will be to provide strategies for dealing with the embellishment requirement in the ANSCA Modern Piano Syllabus. First off, I'd like to introduce Cynthia Delaney. Cynthia is the ANSCA State Rep for Queensland. Cynthia is very active in supporting our organisation and has been conducting workshops throughout Queensland for a number of years. Cynthia is an ANSCA examiner and has been teaching the ANSCA syllabus for many years. She has a number of teaching diplomas and a certificate of Kodai Music Education. Welcome, Cynthia. Thank you, Tony. Um, next, our other presenter today is Dr. Kerry Van Leeflang, who also has a long history with ANSCA as a teacher and examiner. Kerry is ANSCA's co-rep for the Brisbane area and along with Cynthia has been presenting ANSCA workshops for some time. Kerry has a PhD, a Master's and a Fellowship from Trinity College. Her long list of qualifications also includes a music scholarship from the German government. You'll be interested to learn that Kerry is also an accomplished percussionist. I'll now pass you over to Cynthia Delaney. Thank you, Tony. Um, look, I'm delighted to be here. Kerry and I, when we were um, preparing for this webinar, um, we're, we're just so excited to be able to, um, you know, explain to the teachers how you can go about putting some embellishment into the modern stream pieces. When we do our workshops, that's the biggest question. There's teachers that have never taught modern before and their big, big scary fear is that they can't do the embellishment or the improv. And look, we're here today to take the sting out of that. It's so easy. You've just got to do a little bit. Um, uh, with the requirements with the modern stream, you, it's only mandatory to do one piece with embellishment from grade three. You don't have to do it up to grade three. But Kerry and I are both advocates that if you start when they're little down in introductory and preparatory in grade one, then it's not scary. It's only scary for you, you know, because the children, when you show them an idea, they run with it and they come back with all sorts of things give them sort of the um, benefit of the doubt in that you don't have to feed them everything. You just give them an idea. They will run away with it and come back with something really exciting. And you can massage that into place if it's not quite right. But, um, yeah, just, just let your kids have a great turn because it's amazing what they can come up with. So um, I'm going to hand over to Kerry first off. She's going to start with one of her um, introductory pieces and then I'll follow. Thanks, Kerry. Hi, everyone. Uh, for introductory, I have chosen my pussycat. Now, as we go up the grades, by the way, sorry about the pole sticking out of my head, but it's holding my house up. It's kind of important. <laughs> so with the introductory, we only have two lists. And we in the list A, we have pieces in triple time. And in the list B, we have pieces in quadruple time. And mine is from the list A in triple time, and it's called My Pussycat. Now, anyone who was able to look around my room would see that most of the pictures on the wall feature pussycats. And this piece is one of my favorites. As a cat lover, I teach it a lot, and I have a lot of students who also have cats at home. One of the things one of my students did for her embellishment, she sang along with the piece. This is not mandatory. The words are there for fun. Please do not think the children have to sing them. But this little girl, whose name is Lexi, it really wanted to sing the words because she changed it. Her, her cat is Tiberius. And so instead of, I call him Jet, on the second line, she said, I call him Tib. He's big and he's brown. And I can't remember what his the first line was, but her cat is brown. 
And so she changed the words to her cat and said, please, can I sing them in the exam? I said, darling, of course you can. Now, the other thing I like to do here, there are two things I like to do with this piece. A lot of the um, method books from which I teach have songs which have going up in the second octave. So my students are used to this from the beginning of putting hands together. This is quite similar to a song they've already played. So I say to them, hey, let's do the second octave of this, second line of this an octave higher. And then to make a little coda, we can just play the last line a second, the last two bars a second time. Now, sometimes they'll jump back to as written to make a change, sometimes they won't. The other thing you could do is reverse the hand direction if they don't feel comfortable going up. So instead of playing, you could go and just play those first two bars in the reverse direction, if you so wished. And then in bar three, instead of, you'd go, so I'm going to play it to you as written, then I'm going to play it to you with the non-moving version, and then I'm going to play it with the moving version. So this is my pussycat. Oh, and I should say, um, thanks Tony, we might take the music down for a moment now. I'm a bit jealous because Cynthia has some props for her pieces, so I just need to get my prop for this piece. <laughs> just bear with me everybody. So Cynthia has some really neat props for her pieces. And this is my prop for this piece. This is <laughs> my pussycat. This is Tatiana Bunny. I'll just put her back on her chair. There you are. There's my live prop. And here is my pussycat as written. version. And as I said, if the children are not comfortable moving hands, we can just reverse some things. my pussycat. Over to you Cynthia. Thanks Kerry. I'm going to do chimes. And I can find it. There it is. Okay. Now chimes um, lends itself to pedal. I know that when little E start um, doing the piano, you know, the first thing they want to do is touch those pedals and what are they used for and blah, 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 blah. So, you know, you show them through the piano and show them what they do and, of course, they're desperate to have a go and most of them can't reach the floor, let alone reach the pedal. So I've got a lovely pedal extender that sits over the pedals of either my grand piano or my um, upright and it's you can use it like a footstool too. And I know that people ask where I got it from. I got it from um, Bumblebee Music in Brisbane, and they stock them. And so, um, okay, what I get my student to do, they play the whole piece all the way through, and then they shift up their hands to an octave higher, or even two octaves higher. It depends on what they would like to do. And then they put that damper pedal on and leave it on for the whole piece. And they think uh, the last little boy that did this was only five when he did his um, introductory exam and he just thought he was wonderful and it did sound wonderful. So I'm going to play it. I won't play it as is. Well, I will, but I'll add the um, extra part that I do. So here we go. This is Chimes by Andrew Craig's.
I just came back down on that last line. So you just have to do something little like that and it's so much, so easy for them. Thanks, Kerry. Okay, my choice for grade preparatory is Sleepy Koala. Now, remember, they don't have to do anything at this grade. So I like to make it fairly easy. I probably put more in that my kitty cat my pussycat than I normally would but I wanted to show everyone lots of different versions so sleepy koala is a very sleepy straightforward piece what I have done in bar six instead of the E flat semi brief I've done an auxiliary note a lower auxiliary so I have two crotchets and minimum on E flat D E flat then in bar eight between the E flat and the C I put a passing note D nice and simple then in bar 12, as we reach the end, instead of just playing, sorry, that was funny, I'm going to play it three times, going up an octave each time. And then at the very end, I, instead of just leaving the right hand bare, I wait for a minimum and then I put in a lovely cool jazz chord of C, D, E flat which I think just finishes it nicely. Mm. Thanks, Tony. Now we're going to have Sleepy Koala, and I'll play it to you as written first. to do is this bit. If you're a little crescendo diminuendo, the children can usually handle that very well. I think that sounds like the James Bond theme. And the kids all recognise it. They've seen the films. They go, oh yeah, I've heard that. Mum and Dad have watched that. So if they can add that in every time that A natural comes in, that just lifts it a bit more too. So here's Sleepy Koala with the extra notes. piece of music I truly love that piece over to you Cynthia thank you Kerry and I love that chord that you've got at the end it really really makes it um, okay I'm going to do oh big brass band now when I first looked at this piece I thought oh my goodness there's not a lot I can do with that but when you really look at it, and again, just remember, we do not have to be doing embellishment at this level. It's really a choice thing. It's not mandatory with ANSCAR at this level. But you know what? If you get those students starting at the lower level, it's so much easier when it comes to when it's uh, mandatory. So what I did with Big Brass Band was, um, I'll just read the notes there. You will have the notes. A four bar introduction is added using bars one and two, played eight BA higher and then loco. The same format is used as an ending but with a little coda added on with the left hand going down C, B flat, A, G, F and then the lowest F right at the end. And the reason I did this was because big brass band, where do you find them? Besides, besides sort of, you know, a swing sort of era, it's walking up the street for parade and it's a marching band so it's in march time it says march time so keep it nice and steady that's the biggest thing don't go too fast and take as if the 
band is coming down the street and as it gets towards you it gets louder and then it's fully there and then it's going away from you so it's a little softer so that's what the ending coda is so here we go big brass band with an introduction and coda Thanks, Kerry. Over to you. Thank you, Cynthia. We're up to preliminary now, and they're getting a little bit more comfortable, if you've started them early, with their improvisation. My choice here is Moonlit Shadows. Again, one of my favourite pieces. This can be so beautifully played. As written, there's not a lot, as Cynthia said with her last piece, that we can do with this one. Um, it says slowly, crotchet equals 88, and I've written in large letters on my music, if you have an eagle eye you'll see that as I'm playing, not too fast, because I tend to want to do this as a one in a beat French waltz, and of course it's not written like that. So to start with I've put an introduction in, and instead of just playing the first two bars, an octave higher as well. So repeated an octave higher. I haven't done anything again now until bar 8 instead of the minimum and a crotchet in the right hand I have a dotted crotchet quaver and crotchet so I've used a note of the chord. So instead of it goes which I think has that nice little French lilt. In bar 12 in the right hand instead of E, E to A, again I filled in with a chord note in quavers, E, C sharp, A, so the original is and mine is, just gives it a bit of forward momentum. Then in bar 16 I couldn't resist a passing note in the right hand, even though it clashes with the G with the F and left, if I play it quickly, if the kids go sounds wrong and say no 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 you're not supposed to dwell on it it's supposed to be just quickly fluid and it just sounds nice melodically then at the end my mini coda instead of just playing that I go down and play a low A and a D the other biggie is as Cynthia said they love to use the pedal so I will play it as written the first time without the pedal and if they are happy to put the pedal in what I really like to do is get them to use their pedal extender if they need to, most of them do, and then play it with the pedal. So the first time when I play it I'll play it without the pedal as written and then the second time I'll play it with my few embellishments but with the pedal and the pedal truly lifts it and I will go not too fast. embellishments and pedal.
and I think you'd agree that makes it sound a totally different piece of music. When I was playing these for my husband, preparing for the workshop, he went, wow, that sounds like a totally different piece of music. And with a, just a few little embellishments, you can really lift the piece. Not that it wasn't perfect the way it was, but you can make it even more perfect. Mm. Over to you, Cynthia. Thank you, Kerry. Yes, it was beautiful with the pedal. Um, okay, I'm doing Boogie Boogie by Jay Selman. Um, with this one, if you just get my notes in place here, um, an introduction is added using the chords 1, 4, 5, followed by a glissando. Now, I use a stuffed toy or a, a um, business card. Make sure that if you're using a business card that it's a cardboard one, not a plastic one. You'll scratch your keys. Um, but, you know, often the children that are doing this level have got tender little fingers and glissandos are painful at the best of times, aren't they, when you're learning them? Um, I had a boy who was in high school and he used to actually bleed on my keys if he actually repeated them too many times and at home. He just had very sensitive skin. So with the little ease, I used I like to use a credit card, a business card, cardboard, or a little stuffed toy to do it. So when you do it, um, you put your pedal on the course and down the keys you go. That's with the stuffed toy. This is the one with the business card. And you don't have to worry about um, you know putting them back on the piano. The fun part of this is when you do the glissando, you flick it. So you flick off the and just flick the card away. Okay, so here we go. lovely Cynthia. Uh, I hope your toy didn't get a headache. <laughs> Kisses. Oh, he's all kissed better now. That's good. So for grade one, I've chosen Slow Walking Blues. This is again a really pretty piece and I've put a bit of a fancy schmancy introduction into this one. Oh, that's, that's a funny picture we got up there, Tony. And he's got there. Very good. So Slow Walking Blues I think this can do with a really nice little introduction. And before I play it, I've gone F, E, D twice in the bar with a tonic chord in the left hand. And then I've gone to the dominant A in the left right hand and the chord 5. And these are chords that feature in the piece. So it's not something that they aren't playing anyway. Then I am putting, for the more advanced child, a bit of a fancy arpeggio. I'm going A, E. C sharp E A C sharp E A C sharp E A which sounds impressive but really I'm just doing the same thing crossing over my hands then finishing with a dominant at the top then a 5 7 in the left hand and coming from the subdominant G down to D now it's really important when you're doing an introduction that you finish on the dominant so that you've got a dominant note and a dominant chord coming into where you're coming to in the first bar. It doesn't work if you put an introduction that doesn't really meld into your piece. So if you ended on any chord but the dominant, an examiner could possibly not like it. Now, in the body of the piece, you can see in bar seven, there's a very lonely acacia there. I felt it needed friends. So I have added an acacia onto bars three and 12. And I know I've put another one, or did I not? Seems to be only 3 and 12, but at least that's now three acacaturas instead of just one. In bar 4, instead of the static chord in the left hand, I've given it some rhythmic drive by filling out the quavers. I do the same in bar 8, 
So basically at the end of each of those phrases, just giving a bit more rhythmic drive to move to the next phrase. Then in bar 13, I actually find it really hard just to play a dotted minimum in the left hand because we've had the dotted crotchets in the previous two bar. My soul desperately wants dotted crotchets there. So when I play the second time round, you'll hear the dotted crotchets that I so enjoy. Now, I firmly believe you should never do anything twice. So I don't want to go... I'm sorry, I'm bored. So the second time that happens, I'm going to go up an octave. With the right hand. Then at the end, instead of the chord, which is a beautiful jazz chord in itself, I'm going to play some tinkly notes down, E, C, A, F, E, which I just heard in my ear, and I'm sure you all do too, and then I went, that's the sound I want, that's what I'm going to play. So I'll play it straight the first time, and again, I like to pedal this one, and by grade one, the children are more than capable of pedaling, and most of the time, they don't need the pedal extenders. I still have one or two little cherubs who do need them at grade one. So this is Slow Walking Blues, first of all, as written. It's a beautiful piece, but let's just make it even more beautiful. This has got the introduction, the catch to us, and the movement forward at the phrase ends. Oh, and pedal. Again, it sounds like a totally different piece, doesn't it? Yes. I love that piece. Over to you, Cynthia. Thank you, Kerry. Um, all right, I'm going to do... Where are we? Steam Train Loogie. Now, like Kerry mentioned, um, I had some props, and I, I do this with my students. If they do any sort of train... Um, this piece and there's a few across the grades. Um, there's, there's one um, in the lower grade prep or prelim and so if they have a steam train kind of sound or piece um, I use this steam train whistle that I got um, and I picked this up from um, the Dandelion Mountains Up with Puffing Billy and it's got the most amazing steam train whistle. You listen to it. <laughs> And so that's what I say. I go, I buy that, and I say, all aboard, and then we start the piece. All right, so as is, I am going to play this two ways today. I'm going to play it as is because the second time, it has got some improvisation in it. I'll just tell you where that is. Um, I changed several notes in the right hand using a mezzo staccato or staccato touch in bars 11, 13, and 15. Bar 17 right hand notes are played broken up style and then bar 17 to 20 played an octave higher as written with a couple of extra notes added to change the rhythm slightly and we repeat bars uh, 19 to 20 loco and finish with a flourish. Now when we wrote this and as Kerry will tell you 
you might decide that that's how you're going to play the piece and you know you discuss it with your child and then or student and then on the day or you know at the next lesson it's changed slightly it re it doesn't have to be in concrete once you have decided what the improv is or the embellishment is and one of the questions we got asked in the seminar was do you have to write it down does it have to be written down no it doesn't but it helps if you have um, and it doesn't matter if it is written in if you've decided that this is what you want to do if you have a look I don't know if you can see it um, I'll just hold that close to the camera see how I've got some notes written on the top here and that's because um, I'm going to play this twice and one of them will be the second time will be with the backing track now um, I'm sure that um, most of you have heard of Paul Myatt and Gillian Erskine from Forte School of Music. Paul has so very kindly um, done backing tracks for the ANSCAR syllabus, um, series books, sorry, ANSCAR series modern, two books, and he's gone right up to grade three at the moment. So he's going from prep to grade three. And there's a link that you'll all um, get sent out that if you would like to join the next class that he's doing that to introduce that and um, to have access to these backing tracks, um, you'll get a special deal for that. Um, and that's what I'm going to do the second time is actually play at the backing track, but I'll still do some improv, so just listen out for that. So here's the first way without the backing track and with some improv. and I'm sure you had a look at the music there, it goes. So you've got the chords in the right hand. Now, with the backing track, hopefully this is still here for me because you know what it's like. You turn your back on technology and it switches itself off. Yep, that's right. Okay. No. Now, I will mention this. Um, I'm using a backing track that I got from Paul, um, and I, he downloaded it to the Dropbox for me, and I'm, I've transferred this over to an app called Tempo Slow Mo. It's the best little app. It's free. It's a brown, sort of black, brown, orange one, and... Uh, it's called Tempo Slow Mo, all one word, and the um, Tempo is a capital T, the Slow is a capital S, and the Mo is a capital M. So if you download that, you can actually get it to um, slow down or speed up, depending on what you want to do, and it doesn't sort of distort the sound. I mean, if you get it down to about 50% of the 100%, yes, it is distorting, but you, it, it'll go down to about 70% without distorting. And it's the most um, versatile tool. I use it all the time in my studio. So um, that's just a little tip. All right, let's see if this will work now. All right. Thank you. 
grade two now and I have chosen Jumping George which is a ragtime piece and ragtime heads up even though it says brightly 120 if you put that on the metronome it's not as fast as you think it is ragtime should never be played fast I remember as a child playing the entertainer and getting faster and faster and my mum coming in from the kitchen going darling that's too fast slow it down so she could hear it was too fast so there's a little word of warning bright but not fast so for jumping george this has got a lot of wonderful syncopations in it but for my introduction i've taken the first bar and i've done it three times leaving the left hand where it is but taking the right hand an octave higher each time sounding like this <laughs> Remember I said it's got a lead in, so I've done two dominant notes, C, C, to get us into our F major beginning. Then in line two, I've taken both hands up an octave higher for the first two bars, and for the second two bars, I leave the right hand up there, but bring the left hand down. In bar 13, I, instead of going in the left hand, I go for bars 13 and 14 and I continue that idea in bar 16 instead of my left hand says in bar 19 again the right hands up an octave and in bar 21 I've added an extra chord because you can see in bar sorry bar 22 in bar 21 there are four left hand chords I want four left hand chords in bar 22 and to finish instead of it's really neat to put the pedal on and do a little tremolo. Not a particularly fast one because it's not a particularly fast piece, but it's just a gentle fading into the background tremolo. Okay, thanks Tony. This is Jumping George and I'll play it in the original mode first. <laughs> few additions. Cynthia. All right, I have got that blues feel and it's the most amazing little piece. I really love it because it's a slow piece, it says freely with expression, you can just go to town with it, it's so lovely. Uh, what did I say I did in it? Let me have a look. Part two has some chord fill notes, B, D, F in the right hand. 
uh, some uh, Akechatura notes are played as is and some are changed to a Podgitura like in style because it just lends itself to playing a slower sound in there, not so much a faster Akechatura. Uh, bar 11 has the Pravis BG repeated, bar 15 the crotchet is changed to a triplet rhythm. Bar 17 has a run of notes instead of um, the broken chord with the lazy cacciatura added on to bar 18. Um, last two chords are played slowly, a Peggio in style. So I'll just play it through. Here we go. And again, it's a nice piece because it's in 3 4. Thank you. Guess what? I've got another ragtime piece. <laughs> I think I've been dreaming about Reggie Rooster's rag. This tune is a bit of an earworm. So now that we're in the real world of improvisation, I've added some extra notes in the middle section. Now, Something else I should mention too, this piece has repeats. If you're not going to embellish this piece, the usual rule stands, no repeats. In exams, we don't do repeats. The number of times I'm in the exam room and I hear a child do the repeat and I go, oh good, let's see what they're going to do. Oh, they did exactly the same thing. So unless you're taking an improvisation, do not use the repeat. So in the so I probably won't play this one twice because you'll hear it straight the first time anyway. So in bar five, six, seven, and nine, I've added extra notes. The original went. Oh, I'll play these three bars. And I've put in. Because I think that sounds like the rooster pecking. I just like that and I've done it again in nine then I, so you'll hear it straight the first time and then with the embellishment I I like what I've done in 14 I've got very small hands let's see if I'll be able to do it this is how it's written and I've put little pecking notes in and same thing here Instead of, I've got, sorry, and here it should be, but I've got, so I like my little rooster pecking. And because you will hear it in its original version on the first time through, I won't play this song twice. Uh, in bar 24, where there are minims and 26, instead of, and, just made them crotchets and just gives it a bit of momentum. Now I should say at this point that I have piece envy because the piece I wanted to play from this grade my friend Cynthia is playing because I had to play the ragtime. So she'll, she'll be playing a piece in Latin style so I introduced just a smidgen of Latin into this. My last two bars should go but I've repeated the penultimate bar to go. And that's my nod to Latin for this piece. 
Okay, let's have a listen to it. As I said, I will play it as written, but with the repeats, and you'll hear the improvisation on the repeats. composer he's an Australian composer and um, just the children right from the pieces that are in the repertory right the way through his pieces get chosen like as leader of the pack they're just wonderful pieces um, I have a rule in my studio and this is for uh, both myself and the examiner um, I try not to let the children have the piece, repeat pieces so that not if any one of my students will get bored in bling. And, you know, if, if someone, one of my other students wants to learn it, that's okay, we learn it just the same, but only one to present. And that's not an Edsco rule, that's a Mrs Delaney's rule. Because I've got to listen to these pieces, I don't want to hear all my grade threes played all in bling. And there's so many beautiful pieces in the book and in the manual list that you, we're spoilt for choice, really. Um, I, just a little aside, um, I've had that rule ever since I started to teach. And my daughter, who is now 33, I taught her right through to grade 8. Um, and then she went to the teacher that was mentoring me through my teaching diplomas. Because people used to say to me, um, how can you teach your own daughter? And I, was, I thought, we're fine. Right? I, I just put her in as a lesson in between two other lessons. And so we didn't have a problem. Um, and I was able to be the mummy chopping the veggies at the bench and going, oh, that sounded nice, sweetie, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I would never go over and actually correct her or do anything like that as the teacher when it was her practice time in the home. But when the teacher took over, when it was her lesson, I was the teacher. And I taught her and I said, no, you know, this has to happen, whatever. And this particular day, she rolled her eyes at me as her teacher and that's when I kind of went right you're off to a different teacher but um, the spin-off of that was when she was with me there was two other girls her age and her grade and they wanted to play send in the clowns the whole three of them did and I said well you can learn it but you can't present the exam I'll go around the twist so we put names in a hat and I drew one out and she missed out she was not the one that was going to present send in the clowns for her exam and she has never let me forget that, ever. <laughs> I said to her, even she brought it up the other day, she's here, uh, living here now with us, and she said, yes, I remember the time you wouldn't let me learn that piece, Mum. And I said, it wasn't that I wouldn't let you learn it, it's just that you couldn't do the exam. She said, but I remember I didn't want to learn it then anyhow because it wasn't for the exam. So back to Boreen Bling. Um, yeah, this is a favourite piece of the students, it really is. Now, what have I done with this? Um, I play it as is right down to bar 13 basically. So you go right down to bar 13 and um, come along there. Actually it would be to 19. We actually play it through to 19 without much change. 
but then I add an extra bit in. This is now at grade three and you're being asked to now play a piece with some embellishment. So what we do is we go back to repeat bar 13 through to 17, 18, 19 around there. And I do it in reverse. Um, Litten 13 does this. workshops, Kerry takes the section that has the jazz syllabus in it and that's a whole different subject and a whole new ball game but it's an amazing um, little book from or a little syllabus from Christopher Norton and it actually takes you by the hand and helps you do improvisation. It's an amazing course. Um, Kerry often demonstrates that and she talks the way through it and shows people what to do and one of her devices is to take what's there and do it backwards and it certainly works in lots and lots of places. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's about it. I do, uh, from bar 25, and you see I haven't got this in the notes. Do you have a look at this in the notes? Let's have a look. Uh, no, I don't think I have. So go over the page. Oh yes, it's over the page. Bar 25 to 27, both hands are repeated an octave higher, then jump to bar 29 and play loco. Well, I don't jump to bar 29 anymore, I do play 28. Uh, the last chord is played loco, but a PG in style, the last chord is repeated. So you see between the notes going out and now, I've changed my mind again. So that's what happens when you embellish and improvise. Here we go. Oh, and I use some pedal. Thank you, Cynthia. Isn't that a gorgeous piece of music? Now this, my choice for grade four, is also beautiful. This is Willow Wisp. 
This is my favourite grade four piece. And just like I tend to play the rag times too fast, I do tend to wallow in this one. And I have to remind myself not to wallow, or you might all go out to sleep while I'm playing. Now, this is another one that I'm not going to play through first and then play again, because if you have a look, the first two lines on the first page are identical pretty much well, they are identical with the first two lines on the second page so I won't be embellishing those first two lines but when they return from bars 20 to 29 that's when I'm going to play with them I don't do anything with the third line but the fourth line lends itself to a repeat so I play it as written the first time I'll let you hear that second time remember always work with what you've got you don't have to invent something totally new so I've got so I'm just going to fill it in and the third runner I'm just going to start on an A and I'll show you what that sounds like experimenting with ideas you you try things and you go oh, I like the sound of that for instance I've got some notes coming up which I'll tell you when I get to them and Cynthia said to me how did you get to those notes I went I just heard them I could hear what I wanted and I just tinkled until I found what I was in my head so that will often happen too and then when I analyzed I went oh well actually that's part of the chord with the passing note and so I could actually analyze where I got it from but I really did just hear it. And I'm sure as you play with these things, you will hear things too. Now, there are times where you will try something. Both Cynthia and my adorable husband, Gary, both liked this. Tony, I'd be curious to your um, opinion because I've decided not to put it in. So, uh, but I'm showing it as an example of possibly what not to do. Because I did this, I'll show you what it finishes like this, the last one. And then it goes to the next bit, which is beautiful, right? But I was going to put a little cadenza in, and I thought it was over the top. Tony, I want your opinion. I think that's too over the top, don't you? Well, yeah, it's it's effective, but maybe it's a bit much. Yeah, it's the wrong piece for it, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but I I present it now to show you will try ideas. And you might go back and you'll go, yeah, I'm going to do that idea. And then you'll go back and go, actually, I reject that idea. So I originally was going to do that. And I've just put a little cross through my annotation to tell me to do that. Because while it filled up the bar nicely, it really didn't fit the mood of the piece. Now, Tony, can we have the music back, please? Because on bar 20, I've put in some added notes. So this is the same as the beginning. So in the top I've done D, B flat, G, F, which sounds, I think, really pretty. And then in the second bar I do C, A flat, G, F, which will come out like this. Then when I get the crotchets, I'm making it um, a triplet crotchet quaver so a bonus chord really every time there's a crotchet this is my favorite bit I'm taking the next line up an octave and just leaving these bass notes here but to get there I'm doing a gentle glissando ascending so from bar 23 it's going to sound like this And I'm playing these B flats up where I am rather than low because the balance would be right. Then in the next couple of bars, I'm um, as written in uh, what's that 27 and 28, but I'm putting in my bonus chords. Then in bar 36 near the end, after that pretty, pretty cadenza, the melody goes. 
and my ear just went, well, why can't I go up? So starting on the same note, but going up to the tonic. So I've left the left hand the way it is, and I've just played different notes in the right hand. So it will start. But then it will go. That just was very satisfying to me. It felt complete when I did that. So thanks, Tony. This is Willow Wisp. Isn't that just the most gorgeous piece? Doesn't it make you want to sit your grade for exam just so you can play that? That's so beautiful. <clears throat> Over to you, Cynthia. That's beautiful, Carrie. Okay. All right. Um, the grade for piece I have is Rocker Boogie. Now, it's an inlet. And because it's grade four, um, I've, I've added a fair bit of improvisation to it. But whether it's too much or too little, I think it's just right for the piece on what I've done. I've added an intro using bars 13 to 17. And I basically play that as written. And then in bar, 19, uh, bar nine, we just play it as written through. And then bar nine... Um, I add a few extra little notes in that bar nine just to give it a bit of extra flavour. And then because we're coming back to, to do bar 13 through to 17 and I don't want to play it the same way, I've added um, a crotchet triplet and, some, and the quavers are swung in bar 15. And bar 17, I've got the, you've got your uh, D7 chord there, I'll repeat that an octave. And then basically from there, it's just like fills. Um, in bar 22, I play it down an octave. I, bar 23, um, I reverse the triplets. 
instead of coming down like um, I'm going. So you need to, just like Kerry said, take something from the piece that's there. Um, in bar 27, uh, oh yes, I do a DBAG as quaver as mimicking the end of bar 26. So that's just taken it as a mimicking sound there. 28, I turn the semi quavers into a small tremolo. That's at bar 28, which is going uh, normally like this. <laughs> triplet rhythm at bar 34 when we really slow that down I change those to triplets and then I play um, the ending with both hands so here we go I'm going to take it at a steady speed because that's what it says 132 is fairly fast but I like it just that bit slower take some ideas from what's already there. Okay, Kerry, A to R to you? No, it's over to you. Oh, we're doing our manual list now. Okay. Well, that's at the end um, of the series, you know, where we, we take this webinar to, to grade four. So um, you have an idea of what you can do with the pieces right from the beginning. But there's also a wonderful, absolutely wonderful, extensive, manual list. Now Kerry and I have taken a piece that we um, really like out of that list and I've chosen Kinabalu Sunrise by Mark Gibson. Let's grab that book. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this but it's the most beautiful piece. It's along the lines of Willow Wisp, really. Something similar to Willow. Now, mainly what I've done with this is fills. I think that I say on my notes, extra fill notes throughout the piece. Last 25 to 28, left hand does a PGO chord. All right, I'll just play you 25 to 28 as written. It goes like this.
Okay, so I just fill in like that so it's not the block board through there. And. Oh yeah, bar 35. Where are we, bar 35? Oh yes, I do. What did I say in there? Triplets. Um, what I've changed it to since I've done the notes is to do little echoes in there, like this. Just little echoes like that. It's such a pretty piece. Here we go. piece and Kerry tells me it's very popular um, over in Asia. <coughs> I think um, it was written because we have a lot of exams in Kota Kinabalu and when you see the sun right, I'm not an early riser, I've never seen it. But I have seen Kinabalu in the clouds and it's very atmospheric. So if you were up for an early morning walk, it would be lovely. And it, it's quite, it feels quite startling when you have the privilege to be sitting in Kota Kinabalu listening to this piece of music by some lovely young person playing it. It, it gives you goosebumps. It's such a beautiful piece. Now, my piece that I've chosen from the manual list is in stark contrast. As I said, we have our Ansgar books, which are awesome. They have a lot of variety. Everything you need is in those books. But if you wish to go to the manual list, Ansgar has gone to an enormous amount of trouble compiling a really splendid extra list. So that's why we wanted to each finish with one piece from the manual list to show you you don't have to play from the... Ansgar publication. But it's a much cheaper version than buying lots of books. This one is called Beach Buggy Boogie. It's one of my all-time favourites. It's by Martha Meir. And again, I won't play it twice, but for instance in bar seven, I've added extra chords. So in bar, sorry, bar eight it goes. So I'm going to be going. And 
I use that rhythm a lot with the syncopated off beats. In bar 10 it says, but I go, I do that again in bar 14. I really like that bit. Um, while I'm on it, I do it again somewhere. Yeah, I do it again in bar 34. Repetitious maybe. But it's a long way between bars. Then in bar 17, across 17 to 18, it says, I'll just play from the bit before. Well, that's very effective, but how about putting a tremolo in? really neat if you do that. In the in bar 27 you get this rhythm. So when it comes back in the same key at 31, I like to go just putting double notes in. But my favourite bit is Beethoven, one of his favourite tricks was to crescendo to a piano or to go to a piano and then suddenly give you a crescendo. And I've kind of borrowed that from Mr. Beethoven. So the end is written. But I'm putting a little surprise on the end. Oh, Kerry. Which I think, when it's been such a rip snorter of a piece, you really need something big to finish. So this is Beach Buggy Boogie, boy, yeah, I can't say it. Beach Buggy Boogie, got it by Martha Mir. Is that the end of our pieces that we're presenting today? It is, and we are hoping people have lots of questions. Yes. We love questions. We have got a few questions up already, so I'll go back to the chat. I started copying them over. I'll just make sure I don't miss anything, though. There's not that many. Is it generally expected, this is from Sandy, to play the piece twice, once as written and the second time with embellishments, or is this at the teacher's discretion? I might have a go at that. I'd say it is at the teacher's dis discretion. I think I was, I noticed that question come up earlier, and I noticed whenever Kerry and Cynthia introduce an idea, first of all, they won't simplify it, and second of all, they'll play it as written generally and then kind of repeat that bar with, a, you know, a different approach. But some teachers take the approach of playing it through straight as written and then repeating it, you know, with a whole lot of different improvised ideas, and that's fine as well. But uh, it... Tony, can I jump in? I think perhaps the question meant because I was playing it as two totally separate things. No, you don't play it as two totally separate things. Normally, you would include the embellishment in the piece. For instance, in the Willow Wisp, where the section returned exactly the same, that's where I put the improv in. But you certainly wouldn't want to hear the piece once straight through and then straight through again. 
unless it was something with a repeat at the very end of the piece where you had the option of playing the whole piece again and if you did you would certainly need to embellishment is that yeah. what you're saying tony yeah i think that's right i mean like with dot repeats for example they're not required for, for exam purposes but some teachers might take the approach that okay, i can't play it as written and then i will do the dot repeat and but i'll show embellished ideas in the dot repeat i think it's important that you don't cover up technical issues in a piece by saying, well, okay, I embellished here, but it's so much easier than the part that's written. Mm. It's important that you're not um, dodging technical difficulties. So, you know, in that case, um, just be sure that, you know, you've played the part and then perhaps, as Kerry said, in a repeated section, you're showing something different. Tony, can I ask a question here? Does ANSCAR still have those um, CDs of the modern syllabus that um, Robert Keane played? Yes. They do? Yes. So maybe that's a good thing to mention, that the teachers who haven't heard these pieces from the modern, that um, ANSCAR do have CDs that Dr Robert Keane did, and you can listen to these pieces um, played straight. They haven't got any embellishment in them, but they, you, you can get um, an example and know how it's got to sound if you didn't embellish it. Yeah, that's right. So they, they are an absolute um, asset to have. If you attend a NSCAR, Exploring NSCAR, that's usually one of the little prizes or in your teacher's pack. It depends on, you know what ANSCA have thrown in at the time to come up to the teacher's pack. If there's anyone out there who's not an ANSCA teacher and would like to come along to a um, Exploring ANSCA workshop, especially if you're in Queensland, we normally do those around about um, sometime in January, towards the end of January, um, in Brisbane, Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast as a rule. But um, ANSCA also have a link that we did one in Brisbane that was recorded. So it's about a three hour seminar, but absolutely well worth um, going through if you're in a different state to Queensland or a different country. Um, you can um, request from ANSCA that webinar recording. That's right. Good, Cynthia. Uh, another question was from Helen. I'm wondering, uh, in exams, you are not meant to play repeats. Well, you're not meant to play dot repeats unless in that situation that we talked about where you're going to go back and play the same passage that, and it's improvised. But you certainly have to play de capo repeats or del signo repeats, any of those kind of repeats, but not dot repeats. They're not required. Well, first and second, they're actually not allowed. Yeah, we'd actually prefer you didn't do them. Yeah, we don't want you to do them because it's just a time waster for, um, for an exam situation. Ken? Plus the candidate might play it perfectly the first time, but not the second time, and that would be a great shame. Right. Another one from Joanna um, says, uh, can we write a few notes in the music or does the exam book have to be clean? Well, you can write a few notes in the music, I'm sure. The only thing you can't have in your music is answers to general knowledge questions. That's that's the thing that's a bit of a no-no. But you can yeah. write, yeah, you can have prompts in there for your embellishments for sure. Okay, can I just show you what I was doing when I was putting in so that they have an idea? Um, See, if, I don't know if you can see that in the, um, see how I've got notes all over and little bits and yep. hieroglyphics yeah. everywhere? Yeah. You can't really remember what to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not the music written in with a, with a program, it's, it's my ideas written down. And that yeah. kind of thing is perfectly acceptable. Yeah, that's right. I mean, well, you'll only be criticised if there's the general knowledge answers written on your, mm. on your pieces. Any examiner who has um, either the fortune or the misfortune to examine my students, because I think they're pretty good, and the examiner gets chocolate cake. Uh, Mrs. That's Collins will, um, yes. yes, she's going, <laughs> yes. Uh, she will also attest to the fact that I'm a great scribbler, and my students' music is absolutely graffitied with things. And for the children I teach online, I say, 
pick up your pencil. I haven't seen you pick up your pencil. Please write this on the music. And it is a terrible thing for a child to have all these markings erased and then go into the exam. It looks like a piece of music they've never seen before. They've been practiced, and Robert Keane wrote about this in Stretto some decades ago, that you should never take the markings off the music because the children are so used to seeing them, then it looks like a different piece they've yeah. never seen. Yeah, so I'd agree absolutely with Absolutely, the markings can be left on. Sorry, that was rather long winded, but I'm quite passionate about that. Um, thanks, Kerry. San Sandy also said last year I had a boy in prep doing Busy Bee. We changed the rhythm a bit and I marked it on the score. The examiner didn't comment about it, so I guessed it was okay. Well, it's a shame the examiner didn't comment on it, and obviously it was okay, unless, you know, you've lost some marks for some reason. But, yeah, it's a shame the, the, the examiner didn't comment on that. Can anyone recommend a brand of pedal extender? And someone actually answered, Helen, it was Sandy, and it, she said, if you Google music bumblebees, and yes. I think I've heard, I think I've yes, heard. Yes, that's where I got mine from. Yeah. They are in yep. Brisbane and they're amazing and that's where I got mine from and yep. they are very prompt and things are packed very well. I've never had a bad um, a bad delivery from them and I have got a pedal extender and it is quite heavy and um, the one I've got... Uh, they're very heavy. I think, Cynthia, you've decorated yours though, haven't you? No, no, um, not my pedal extender. I'll just go get it while you're chatting. Yeah, yeah, I've only heard good things about music bumblebees. I can't remember. I think they were at a conference we were at. It might have been APPC. It could have been something like that. No, they're very, very good. No, as and Cynthia said, very prompt. And it's a heavy brute of a thing. I take it to all my concerts because the small children all use pedal and we always have the pedal extender at the concert. And it's, uh, yeah, it's heavy. Yeah. It's very heavy. It's really um, good quality. It's very good quality. That's the back of it. That's your pedals on the side, and then it's very. It, sometimes we use it as a footstool, and that sits over the pedals, and it's got adjusters underneath. So you know how some pedals are low to the ground, others are high. Yeah. That can adjust, and as long as they're sitting smack bang over the two pedals, it works perfectly. And the other thing, see the knobs on the side of Cynthia's pedal extender that look like the sides of a piano stool. Yep. You can actually raise and lower the foot level as well, depending on the chart. Very good, very good. Um, you talked about tempo slow-mo. I put that into the chat, uh, Cynthia. That was T-E-M-P-O-S-L-O-M-O. -O -O. I, I, will... I wasn't sure if you said S-L-O-W when I typed it in there. No, I think she said S-L-O. And I'll just have a look for it. Sorry, it is S L O W. Um, oh, it is, is it? Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll type that in. I think they probably would have got a hit with that anyway. But it's, it's called Tempo Slow Mo. I don't know if you can see that there. Can you? Yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slow Mo is kind of one word by the look of it. Yes, it's all one word. Tempo Slow Mo is all one word with capital T, capital S, capital O. It's an amazing uh -huh. little app. And amazing that it's free. Yes, it sounds really good, and it's not just for um, these Paul Might tracks we're talking about. You can use it for anything. anything into it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. that'll be great for a lot of other Ansker stuff. You know, there's backing tracks for the jazz syllabus. And... Yes, any of that. You yeah. Can, you can um, import it in there, and you know, away you go. I've done um, Mark Gibson's music. You know, from um, Encore on Keys. I teach out of that. Yeah. yeah. I slow that down for kids. Sometimes it's just a little too fast. Yeah, that's right. And so it's an amazing thing to have. Or you might have a piece that's too slow and you go, I'd really rather play this faster and you can speed it up. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Really good. Um, so Stephen was saying this is excellent news about the backing tracks and I think he was referring to the slow-mo. Also, Ken, also you can easily make your own high-quality backings quickly and easily using session bands. So if you want to have a go at making your own backing track, Session Band is the way to go. Okay, that's good. Uh, so Evie has asked, I want to ask about the songs Ragtime and Boogie. 
which no, with no written swing or straight beat. Can I choose myself? I want to play swing or straight beat. Well, you well, can I'll, never I'll, play swing in ragtime. No, I was just going to pipe in and say, yeah, ragtime should be played straight every time. I think that's right. Would you agree, guys? Absolutely. And yeah. some boogie and... pieces are, are written as straight and some are written as swing and yeah. some you can choose. That's right. It's hard to be categorical about uh, boogie, so you'll just kind of have to do your research with that. But this certainly some, some boogies can be swung. I think if it's yeah. not, um, I made that inquiry too, Tony, just to clarify that before this webinar. Remember the uh, steam train boogie? Yeah, idea? we asked yes. Andrew, didn't we? Yeah. Yes. And it's not, it's not indicated to be swung or not. So when I play it without the backing track, I don't swing it because to me um, it's more like on a train track and, you know, it's smooth. You haven't got a bumpy train ride. But the backing track has got a swung backing, backing to it and it sounds amazing too, as you heard. It's completely different but it's just as nice. So um, because there's not a specific thing on the written score to say swing the quavers or not, then I think the choice is up to yeah, I don't think you'll get into too much trouble there. You will with ragtime, though. Yes. <clears throat> ragtime should be played straight. <clears throat> um, from Stephen, again, are, are chord substitutions, e.g. changing major to seventh, major seventh or suspended fourth allowed? What, Absolutely. Um, what about things like pentatonic scales or blue scales? Well, I think that's the yes for all that, isn't it? Yeah, if they fit, yeah. go Yes, on. definitely. If they can fit it into the piece nicely and it's uh, integrating well, then that's all good. Um, you've got some nice comments here as well. I could sit here reading them out. You've had a fun afternoon, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for this webinar from Alice, Central Australia. This is from Fred. We're a bit isolated and it's often not easy to get PD live. Fantastic is really valuable. Okay, that's the end of the questions. There's other some positive comments here as well, guys. Well, so, I'd like to just say thank you to everybody. I've had a ball. Um, it's been, um, you know, really, you know, I've been really um, practicing this week because the week before I had food poisoning, couldn't practice the whole week and I'm going, oh horrors, you know, it's got to be happening but it's been so much fun and of course, I've, you know, touch base with Kerry and we've listened to each other. Um, so it's great to be sort of bonding again with colleagues and so forth and um, if you're not an ANSCAR teacher, that is, you know, you've got all the lovely resources out there to come and jump on board. And if you live in Queensland, um, you know, come and, and you, my contact's in the front of the syllabus. If you're not an ANSCAR teacher, um, you can apply for, it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in New Zealand or Australia or Asia. You no, 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 you can't in Asia. Sorry, Cynthia. You can't in Asia? No, okay. we haven't got a program in Asia yet. Okay, all right. So um, New Zealand and Australia, you can apply for a teacher's pack. So um, yeah, that's got a, which has got a free syllabus in it and a lot of other goodies in it, and um, we're only a phone call away. And of course, the awesome office staff—they're only a phone call away to help you. That's it. Did you want to say anything, Kerry, before I give you both a wrap at the end? Uh, no, just thank you everyone for attending. I hope you've had as much fun as we did. I think you could tell we had a ball presenting this. It's been a lot of fun. And thank you very much for giving up your Sundays to come and be with us today. And thank you, Tony, for hosting for us. Thank you. Being our tech support today. Thanks, Kerry. Look, it was an amazing presentation from both of you. Thank you so much. You've given up a lot of your own time to make this happen today. So that is very much appreciated by everyone at ANSCA. You've given teachers, I reckon, a lot of wonderful ideas to, to start exploring embellishment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't be afraid. It's not that big a deal. We use the word improvisation, which I sometimes wonder whether it's really the right word. We're not talking about full on jazz improvisation, which is scary, I suppose, if, you know, but we're just talking about adding a little bit here and a little bit there to your pieces, just so that you're becoming creative yourself. That's really what it's about. Um, 
Now, don't forget you've got those special offers in your um, webinar email, so please take advantage of those. And since Cynthia brought it up earlier, we'll add the CDs to that list and we'll offer you 30% discount on, on the CDs if you purchase them in the next few days as part of the webinar. So there's a lot of goodies going out. There are, and we've got a discount if you want to become a teacher subscriber for Australian and New Zealand teachers. Yeah. Thank you, Cynthia, and thank you, Kerry. Uh, the books that thank you, are available and uh, Paul Myatt's offer of, um, you know, the backing tracks and so forth. So that can be emailed out to everybody, can't it, Tony, all the, all the participants? So the yes. Books, yes. Definitely. There's, a, there's um, some uh, workshop coming up from Paul, is that right, Paul Myatt? Yes. Cynthia? Yeah, yes. and we've, we've got a link because um, Paul Myatt's now covering the ANSCA syllabus with um, training courses and backing tracks, so have a look. You might want to get involved with that. It looks very interesting. And Stephen, Stephen said in the chat, I can show you session band for improvising if you want. Yeah, Stephen, I'd be interested in looking at that. So um, if you'd like to email me your contact, please, my email is cyn. DEL7 at gmail.com. I'd be really interested to explore that avenue. Oh, I don't if you can't remember that. Just email the office email in your in your um in your email and we'll forward it on to Cynthia. Okay. Okay. That All brings right, our session to a close. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Cynthia, and thanks, Kerry, and thank you thank everyone. You. Thanks for attending. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.